we are going to open this special day, this Sabbath. We're actually seeing that Sabbath is really intended to be uh, a mini Passover. And so tonight we're going to open this Shabbat in a special way with this Passover elements. So join us. You may want to get uh, in your home. You may want to get a uh, some unleavened bread, or if you don't have unleavened bread, a cracker will work, or, or even, <laughs> even some bread if you have that in your house, and a little bit of juice or wine. And we're going to open this up tonight in a, in a way that Jesus would have uh, 2,000 years ago. So, Malki, if you'll honor us by lighting the candles and welcoming the presence of the Lord. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedshanu b'metvotav v'tzivanu lehiot or legoim v'natan lanu et Yeshua meshicheinu or haolam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us with your word. You commanded us to be a light unto the nations, and you gave us Yeshua, our Messiah, who is the light of the world. So I want to invite you now to the table of the Lord. Yeah. And here is the dessert that has been um, buried and it has been brought back and it has a new name. And now this is the meal that Yeshua, Jesus said, I have long yeah. to celebrate this with you. What tough words wow. that Jesus said mm -hmm. during that last um, uh, Passover with his disciples. And so he, he took the bread and he lifted it up to heaven, and this is what he prayed in Hebrew. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You are the King of the universe who brings forth the bread from the land. Yeshua, we thank you for your body that was given for us, that with your body given for us, that it removed sickness, disease, plague, pestilence, everything from our homes, and we declare tonight with your body that was given for us, that this plague cannot come near our households. We are declaring before heaven and earth today that as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. And so we take the, the bread, everyone, if you could take and serve the bread to your family. Let us partake of the body of Jesus together. And then Yeshua took a cup, but it's not just any cup. During the ceremony, there are four cups during Passover. This is the third cup, the, cur the cup of redemption. For, he's, for God told uh, the Israelites in Exodus, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Wow, Yeshua, Jesus took that cup and he was saying to us at that Passover meal, I'm redeeming you with an outstretched arm. And so I want you to just take this cup in faith and declare it as we take this uh, together. Yeshua lifted up the cup to heaven and he prayed this prayer in Hebrew. He said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You are the king of the universe who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Yeshua, we thank you for your blood that removes all of our shame. We thank you for your blood that removes all of our sin. Yes. And we thank you for your stripes yes. that we are made whole. Yes. And we thank you for your sacrifice, for your blood that was poured out for us. And we thank you for your sacrifice in your name. Amen. Wow. Partake. You are welcome in this place Be enthroned upon our praises May our worship rise like incense As we magnify the sun Mighty God of Israel You're the Lamb upon the throne All blessing and honor 
to my God forevermore. Even so, even so, even so, yes, you come. Come and take your place on your throne, Jerusalem. We join our hearts together. We come in one accord. The bond of peace unites us in the spirit of the Lord. Clothe us with salvation in robes of purest white. We're the body of Messiah. We are precious in your sight. Even so, even so, even so, Lord Jesus, come, O Christian Christ, for the returning of our King. Come and take your place on your throne, Jerusalem. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. of the temple, when all the work was done, everything was finished, the Lord spoke to Solomon and he said these words in 2 Chronicles 7, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. I'll say that again. Send a plague among my people. Hello. I think we're experiencing this right now. He goes on to say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then not only will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So God, tonight we are humbling ourselves before you, Lord. We are turning from our own ways, from our own thoughts, God, and refocusing our attention on you, Lord. We're seeking after you, God. We're praying for your spirit to inhabit our homes, our families, our nation, our world right now, God. And heal us, Father, as we call your name. We call your name. We call your name. We call your name. Yeshua, we call your name, if we call your name, we call your name, 
salvation. Sing that with us. We call your name. We call your name. We call your name. Yeshua. And we call your name. We call your name. We call your name. Salvation, Lord, we seek your face. Turn from our own ways. We humbly pray and call on your name. Lord, we seek your face. Turn from our own ways. We Call on you. 
your name Yeshua This Passover is unlike any that the world has ever seen. But we're seeing some things in this that are truly remarkable. We, we know about the, the new covenant that was revealed at that second Passover. There have been two Passovers that changed the world forever. That first Passover of Moses changed the world forever. And in this Passover of Jesus, of Yeshua that we're celebrating now, it changed the world forever. And, and I want to say to you, I believe that this Passover, as we celebrate this year, 2020, is changing the world forever. There is never going to be the new normal. Some are hoping that there is going to be, you know, this will just be a couple days, a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, and then we'll go back to life as usual. No, no, life as usual is a thing of the past. There are several reasons for this. I believe that the Lord is creating a new wineskin to receive the new wine of these last days. We've been declaring for a long time, we're in the last days. Friends, I've sang that song, these are the days of Elijah. I've sung that song for 25 years. And now we have stepped into them in the most remarkable way. R remember the promises that God made to Abraham. I'm going to take us back even further from that first Exodus. The, the air, the atmosphere is pregnant with the voice of God. Prophecy is, is low hanging fruit at this time. For those who have ears to hear and those who have eyes to see, remember the two promises that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, I'm going to take your barren bodies and I'm going to make of them a great nation. He spoke to Abraham and to Sarah. I will make you into a great nation. He said, I'll bless you. And then he said, beyond that, every family on the face of the earth will be blessed through you. What an amazing, I mean, can you imagine what Abraham is thinking? I'm a hundred years old. I have no strength. My wife is barren. Isn't it interesting that the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all barren? And yet he promised to them a great nation. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, Yahweh, Jehovah, says to Moses, speak to the Pharaoh and tell him, Israel is my firstborn. Listen to this. I want them to know my name. Can you, can you feel the heart of the father who has hundreds of thousands of children that are now being pressed and persecuted in the land of Egypt and they don't know his name? They don't know that his name is salvation. They don't know that his name is is deliverance. They don't know that his name is, I will provide for you. They don't know that his name is Adonai Tzvaot, that he's the Lord of hosts, that he is Adonai Yira. They don't know that he is, his name is, I am the Lord who heals you. And so he calls Moses out. He demonstrates who he is. And he says, go to my firstborn. He says, say to Pharaoh, Israel's my firstborn. Let my son go that they may worship me. We all know that. But do you remember that he said this? If you will not let my first son go, Pharaoh, I will kill your firstborn son. This is serious stuff. When you belong 
to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Jesus, Yeshua, is the Lord of your life. You are his treasured possession. He watches over you. He keeps you. He guards you. He fights on your behalf. You belong to him. And he will keep what we commit to him until that day. In this, in this year of 2020, and I know it's a different year according to Bible 5780. In this 2020, many are declaring that this is the year of perfect vision, or it's the year of the roaring 20s. I like that roar, because as you may know, uh, we created a project just last year called Roar from Zion, where we took that prophecy out of Joel chapter 3, and he says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Nothing has changed since Joel proclaimed those words. There are multitudes even tonight in the valley of decision trying to decide who's God, whose word am I going to follow, who's going to provide for me, who's going to take care of me. I've lost my job. I've lost my salary. I've, I've lost my whatever. Who's going to provide for me? There is a lion and I can hear the sound of his approaching. If there was ever a time to roar, it is now. Joel chapter 3, and it starts for me at least in, in, chap, in verse 14. I just spoke that multitudes in the valley of decision. And the sun and the moon will be darkened. The stars will no longer shine. But look what the Lord says. He says, I will roar from Zion and I will thunder from Jerusalem. Listen to this word. That word, roar, in the Hebrew, lot, Hebrew words often have a dual meaning. And I, I want to get to one other one before we uh, close our time together. But this word, roar, is sha'ag. Sha'ag. Say that, sha'ag. It's not only the sound of a lion that is overtaking its prey, but it's also the sound of a desperate cry. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's almost polar. And yet, I was sitting in my study a while ago, and I said, Lord, how can this be? What are you talking about? There are multitudes in the valley of decision. Everything is crumbling around them. And yet you say, you will sha'og, you will roar. And he said, it's simple. When my people cry out in despair, like those Israelites in Egypt, he said, I will roar from Zion. When I hear the sound from my people, when they cry out to me, remember the Lord said to Moses back in Exodus, I'm hearing the sha'ag, I hear the cry of my family. My people are kept in slavery. They're making bricks. They're not being paid. They're dying in the mud pits of Egypt. And I am sending you to say to Pharaoh, let my son go or I'll kill yours. These are most unusual days. I encourage you, call on the name of the Lord. He is a strong tower of safety. And when he hears your voice, he will thunder. He will roar out of Zion. It is an amazing thing. The Lord is so good. So in, in Exodus chapter 11, verse 1, God is now speaking to Moses and he says, tell Pharaoh, this is the last one. And because you wouldn't let my firstborn son go, I'm going to take your firstborn son. And he said, when this happens, he will push you out like Sarah pushed Ishmael out of the house. This Egyptian will now push the Jew out of the house. He'll push the Israel out of the house. The Hebrew word, oh, this is so good. The Hebrew word there is kashiloch kala. Kashiloch kala. He will push you out. Now, as I said about the Passover table, 
There are mysteries that are hidden right in plain sight. You're going to love this. That word kala has a dual meaning. It means it is finished, it is paid for, but it's also the word bride. It's the word bride. Pharaoh will push out not only a son, but he will push out a bride. What in the world am I talking about? You see, when that final plague hit, Pharaoh called Moses and he said, you and all your people get out of Egypt. Go, go, leave. But he also says a strange thing. He says, before you go, bless me. At this point, Pharaoh realizes he is no longer a god. He never was a god. He doesn't have authority over the god of all gods. And so he says to Moses, get out, get out. I push you out. Kishaloch, kala, you and all of these people. Now we've found that in Exodus 12, 38, that it's not only Israel that goes out, but it's a mixed multitude. There are Egyptians who come out with the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are those from the nations who come out. They were there in Egypt doing business. They had businesses, much like in New York City. There are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who do business in New York City. That's the same at the time of the Exodus, not only were the sons of Jacob pushed out, the, the Israelites, but there also came out with them Egyptians, also came out this mixed multitude of all the nations. Now remember that word kala. So the sun comes out, but in a disguise, a mystery, there is this kala that comes out because the price has been paid. And so they come out of Egypt along with the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But before they leave, they're told, go to all the Egyptian homes and ask them for gifts. So they go to all the Egyptian homes where they were, and they took gold and silver and fine clothing and as a farewell, the Egyptians said, please leave before we all die. They gave the Israelites the best that they had. Why? Well, let me suggest three reasons to you. First, it was in payment for the hundreds of years that the sons of Jacob served Pharaoh and the people of Egypt as slaves. They were paying them back wages. Two, there was uh, a necessity in the, in the wilderness. God was going to instruct Moses to build a tabernacle just like the one in heaven, and it needed gold and silver, and it needed uh, the skins of animals, and it needed fine linens and all. But I want to suggest to you that there's a third reason, a mystery that's hidden in this word kala. I want to suggest to you that the Exodus is not only a picture of the release of the son, the firstborn son of God, but he was bringing out a bride in disguise. He was bringing out a bride of the house of Israel, of the house of Ishmael, of the nations, that there would be out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, a bride being brought out in disguise. So what do you need as a bride? First of all, a bride, before she's wed, goes through a mikvah, a washing, a baptism, if you will. So God calls this mixed multitude out, and they come through the Red Sea. And she's 
purified. She's washed. And what do you do as you're going to a wedding? You don't wear slave clothes. You don't wear the old tattered stuff that you made bricks with. You put on fine clothing. And you don't go to a good Jewish wedding without a gift. They're carrying gold and silver. And what happens before the wedding? You have a fine banquet. And what did he do? He brought them out into the wilderness and they'd been eating whatever they were eating as slaves, but now they're eating bread from heaven, manna. He causes quails to fly into the camp and they're eating roast quail, quail under glass. They have quail almondine. They have fresh manna and they're thirsty. So out of the rock of their salvation, he brings forth cool, clean, clear water to refresh them. And then he leads them to an altar. He takes his people, remember a mixed multitude, not only the sons of Israel. He takes them to an altar, a mountain in the desert with a fire burning on top of the altar, his presence. And he calls them up to the mountain, every one of them, he says, come up for a wedding. I'm marrying you. But they were afraid. They were afraid of the, the smoke and the thunder and the loud sound. So Moses, as a representative, goes up, kind of like the best man, if you will. And he goes up the mountain. And what does he receive? He receives two tablets of stone that are written by the finger of God. I would suggest to you, that it was a marriage ketubah. It was a marriage license that God said to Moses, here are the laws by which this union between you and me will operate. Some have wrongly, I think, set that aside and said, oh, that's that's the law of Moses. I want to suggest to you that it's a marriage covenant. God says, I will marry myself to you. I invite you to come under the canopy of this wedding. And he signs it like every good ketubah. He signs it with his own finger. And then he says to his bride, be very careful because this is a covenant of blood. I have paid the price. It is finished. And this covenant in my blood is till death do we part. And I am a jealous husband. I love you with an everlasting love. Remember, he's speaking to a mixed multitude. I want you to hear that. He's not speaking only to the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's speaking to the sons of Ishmael. And he's speaking to the nations. Way back in Abraham's day, he made this covenant. And he promised he was going to do it. But it's been, it's a mystery that we've had a hard time seeing. Because whether we're Jew or Gentile, there's this this pride that, that shields our eyes from seeing how great, how deep, how wide are the promises of God, how extravagant is his love. And when he says something, he fills the cup to overflowing. And this is the covenant that he's invited you and I into. So they came out as a bride in disguise. So this year, and I'll finish with this, we have walked into a fullness that the world has never seen before. We celebrated the Passover with over 150 nations, 
our words were translated into 27 languages real time. And we took communion together. We celebrated the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and the fullness of it, this communion, his body and blood, as a bride across the nations of the earth. And listen to this. It was hosted by the fullness of the restoration of the house of Abraham. You see, his house has been divided. Abraham's house has been divided between Jew and Arab for all of these millennia. There was animosity between the two because they didn't celebrate the same covenant together. But I want you to know, at this Passover, everything has changed. David Damien, an Egyptian Christian, an Asherin trader, Messianic Jew, hosted this worldwide table of covenant together as the restored house of Abraham in Jerusalem, the throne of the great king. From the underground church in China to the oppressed and persecuted in Tehran, to those of North America and Europe and Africa and Asia, at the same moment, we took the bread of the lamb's body that is pierced, striped, and bruised. And we took the cup, the third cup of the Passover, that fulfills the promise, I will redeem you, says Jehovah, with an outstretched arm. And at the same moment, at the beginning of Passover, we took of the table of the covenant, and I promise you, the world will never be the same. We had the privilege here in Jacksonville to open the Seder, and three and a half hours later, <laughs> with all of these nations partaking, we were given the privilege of closing with the priestly blessing. When I saw this, I shook for an hour. I couldn't control myself. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, starting in verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Yeshua, on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter or the finisher of our faith. Listen to this. Who for the joy... <clears throat> set before him. He endured the cross. He scorned the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of our father. Listen to this. I believe sitting at this table that day, the Lord said to me, you've now seen a picture of the joy that was set before me by which I could endure the cross. I could scorn its shame because I saw the fullness of my promise to my friend Abraham 
that out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, they would come together at my table of peace. I have my family back. This wouldn't have been possible without what we are experiencing right now. Because we would have been about our business. I'd have been traveling somewhere. Our, our homes would have been doing without dads and, and, and we'd have been about our, our busyness. But on this Passover, the Lord is calling out a bride out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, a priesthood, because his table must be satisfied. I want to encourage you. This is not a curse. We are a blessed people. And yes, we have authority and power in the earth. But can we not see beyond all of the stuff? So let us celebrate on the special days, the one who has paid the price the one who said, it's finished, it's paid, it's enough. Can we believe that? Can we trust that to know that he who began a good work in us, he will bring it to completion. And if we will just say no to the shame and no to the challenges and the fear and hold fast to him, who is our salvation, who is the bread of affliction, who is the cup of salvation. He will hide us in the shelter of his wings. He will sing over you songs of deliverance. He will speak tenderly to you. And he is the Prince of Peace. He's the lover of your soul. Believe, trust him. He will do it. He said, when you speak over my family, speak these words. He said, when you do, I will place my family name on them and I will bless them. Nathan, do the English, please. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine, shine upon, upon you and be gracious, gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his, his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Vichoneka Isadonai Isadonai Panabelecha Veasem Lecha Shah